There we go. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this is the consortium's, the maiden voyage of the consortium's of uh, Indo-Pacific researchers military history team. And we've got a great panel uh, for people to consider this evening. Um, as, as was stated in the introduction, you know, Otto von Bismarck said once, I don't learn from experience. I prefer to learn from other people's experiences. And so if there are things that the history can teach us, um, there, is, it, it, there are lessons that can be learned and applied even today, both in terms of how we got where we are in this Asia Pacific and the Indo-Pacific in some ways, but also lessons um, for war fighters and decision makers based on what to do and what not to do based on experience of what has happened before. And from those perspectives, uh, in many ways, the, the war in the Pacific in World War II is a tremendous laboratory for that. It's a laboratory for joint warfare, which if you consider what the, the potential scenarios of future armed conflict in the Indo-Pacific look like, may very well be, it's going to be a joint theater no matter what. But also from a geopolitical standpoint, geography standpoint, and from how um, you know, those lessons in the memory of the Pacific War remains a geopolitical issue in many ways in the Indo-Pacific today and how it influenced the development and the perspective of the various countries um, that are players in that region and how they got to be where they are. That's a lot to cover. We're not gonna cover all of it this time, but we have every intention of continuing to cover that um, both in our writings, in other panel discussions like this, and, and at some point as well as, as part of the consortium's podcast series, more to follow on all that. But tonight we're gonna look at three case studies in the Pacific War. Um, and specifically their lessons for war fighters, for decision makers um, related to the Pacific War and in some cases to today. Um, we've got a great panel. I'm going to introduce them. The way this is gonna work is I'm gonna introduce them. Um, then we're gonna go from each 20, each presentation will take about 20 minutes. If anybody has questions, please put them in the chat and uh, there'll be some time at the end for conversation, perhaps amongst the panel, but also um, we'll be addressing any questions at that time. Um, so the first up is going to be uh, Lieutenant Grant Willis, Willis of uh, the U.S. Air Force, stationed out of Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. He is a, a graduate of the Air Force ROTC program at the University of Cincinnati and has written for both the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs and the Consortium. Uh, you can find some of his scholarship on the website. Um, our second presenter is going to be uh, Lieutenant Brendan Donnelly, also of the U.S. Air Force, also out of Cannon Air Force Base. Um, got his uh, degree from uh, Bowling Green State University, the Air Force ROTC program there, and has actually partnered with Grant on several of the writings uh, for the consortium and for the journal. Um, and both represent good rising voices among the officers, the young officer corps, particularly in the Air Force. And then lastly, bringing up the batting, batting cleanup, I guess, is uh, Jose Custodio. Um, who is in Manila. I've gotten to know Jose uh, a lot, too many years ago to count. Um, he is a noted defense commentator, um, has been heavily involved with the Philippine Defense Department, the Philippine uh, Armed Forces Museum, and uh, remains a respected and in-demand voice on Asia, Asia Indo-Pacific affairs today. Um, and so with that, I'm going to get out of the way. I hope you enjoy the panel. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. And Grant, I'm going to throw it over to you. All right. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that intro. And uh, is everybody able to say th see this okay? Everybody good? Awesome. All right. Cool. All right. So first off, uh, we're going to talk about the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, 1943, Billy Mitchell's dream realized. Okay, this is one of the battles that you don't really hear about too much from an Air Force history perspective, right? We hear about the strategic bombing campaigns from the 8th Air Force uh, over Germany. We hear about the 20th Air Force bombing Japan with Curtis LeMay. We don't really hear a lot about the Southwest Pacific, but that's what we're going to do today, right? Uh, this, this battle has been described as one of the most one-sided victories in the history of warfare. And it just so happened it was a joint operation. It was combined up between the United States Air Force, the precursor of the United States Air Force, the Army Air Forces, uh, and the Royal Australian Air Force against uh, the Japanese Empire in 1943. So with that, uh, there's always this, since I'm an active duty uh, officer in the Air Force, 
the uh, Department of Defense disclaimer here. So any views and opinions expressed or implied in uh, CIPR are those of the authors and should not be constructed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education Training Command, Air University, and other agencies or departments of the U.S. government or their international equivalents. Okay, now that we're through that. Awesome. So let's get some background of what we're talking about, right? It's 1943. It's March. Okay, this war for us in the Pacific and the rest of our allies began in 1941, December 7th, right, with a Japanese supernova just exploding through the entire Pacific, just crushing absolutely everything and overrunning absolutely everybody. By 1943, that's over, right, especially in the Southwest Pacific. Guadalcanal has been reversed. The Americans uh, have won at Midway already back in June of 42. We landed in uh, August of 42 in Guadalcanal. We're working up the Solomon chain. And now MacArthur, after getting kicked out of the Philippines, is directing the Southwest Pacific area as commander in chief of that uh, part of the war. And he is directed at New Guinea and Rabaul, the Japanese base that captured New Britain. So with the Japanese withdrawal of Guadalcanal by 1943 in February, the Japanese land offensives have been repelled by the Australians along the Kokoda Track over in New Guinea. So if you can look at where about Ohio should be, I'm from Ohio, so I'm a little biased to this map, where New Guinea is. So let's look at this map as an example of how big of a space we're talking about, right? The Pacific is huge. The, the number of miles involved are, are just astronomical. Some people just can't even comprehend it. So when we're talking about, hey, this squadron went to go bomb this, or this surface ship went to, this fleet went to go and sail here. We're talking about a lot of mileage, right? We're talking about a lot of space. So it just gives you a little bit more of an appreciation of what we're working for, right? And the Battle of the Bismarck Sea is right in between New Britain and New Guinea, if you can see that. It's right around where Pennsylvania joins with Maryland and Virginia, right there in that gap, right? So the Allied momentum for the offensive in the Southwest Pacific area through the Solomons in New Guinea is a possible threat to everything that the Japanese have worked so hard to secure in the Dutch East Indies. So we're talking Borneo, right? We're talking Sumatra, modern day Indonesia, Malaysia, Malaya, Singapore, right? All of these places are natural resources rich. And if MacArthur can take New Guinea and he can cut off Rabaul on New Britain, he can start to threaten those sea lanes, right? The US submarine force is doing a great job with seeking everything that's moving. If the Air Force can get involved in that, start bombing the oil fields and start bombing those transport routes, it's going to be pretty difficult to fight a war as Japan at that point, right? So that's the whole objective here. And the Japanese obviously don't want that to happen, so they're going to send everything they can to try and stop it in New Guinea. A little bit more of the background here. So by December of 42, Imperial General Headquarters is pretty much getting, you know, they're taking the hint. Uh, they're getting an idea, hey, you know, we need to send more stuff to New Guinea. We need to hold that front at all costs because that's going to be an open door for the Allies to start bombing uh, and start disrupting that supply chain that we need to keep this war going. So they're, they're going to send the 51st Division and, and other supporting elements over to the New Guinea front. And obviously the Australian and, and U.S. intelligence by 1943, we've all heard about the station hypo and, and the intel uh, after Pearl Harbor and, and tracking uh, Yamamoto's movements uh, for Midway, and then also tracking him down with the P-38s, you know, we got him later. U.S. intel and Australian intel is pretty good by this point, right? We're able to figure out, hey, there's a convoy forming in Rabaul. They're going to send a relief force over to New Guinea. We need to stop it. Well, for MacArthur, he doesn't have a navy. He's got a little tiny surface force that's able to project the pr approaches to Australia. Admiral Nimitz and Halsey, they're doing their thing. Right, they're in the Central Pacific. You know, they're doing the Gilbert Islands, all that stuff in the Central Pacific. MacArthur's got no navy to intercept this with. He does have an air force, though, and then we're going to get into that about how innovation and counter maritime land based air operations is really developed for this battle. But it's going to come in handy for MacArthur because this is the only maritime strike weapon he has to stop this landing from happening and this reinforcement from getting to New Guinea. So the convoy is going to set sail on uh, 28th February 1943, and going into the order of battle, just to understand what we're dealing with, we're dealing with eight destroyers from the Imperial Japanese Navy. They're going to be providing that escort. They're going to be sending eight troop transports. So those are the merchantmen that are going to be carrying uh, General Adachi's 51st Division and headquarters for the 18th Army. 
and other supporting elements are going to come, right? He's bringing logistics. He's bringing air, airfield construction guys. He's bringing uh, 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 any aircraft artillery. And he's also bringing uh, a detachment of SNLF, Special Naval Landing Forces. Those are the Japanese Marines. And they're going to be coming down in that convoy, and they're going to face the uh, U.S. Army's 5th Air Force. Uh, it's going to be divided up into B-17s, B-24s, B-25s, A-20s. These are going to be your uh, heavy bombers and medium uh, bombers and attack aircraft. There's also going to be P 38s involved, uh, for fighter cover for the, uh, U.S. guys. And, uh, don't forget about the RAAF. The Royal Australian Air Force is there and they are there in strength. The number nine operational group under Air Commodore Joseph Hewitt. He is going to commit several, uh, squadrons. I'm not going to read them off here for you. Uh, but he's got a mixture of domestic, uh, U.S. Lend Lease and British made aircraft that he's going to employ to great effect to support the Americans. This is joint operation, joint planned, uh, uh, joint contemplated, and the tactics that they're going to employ are pretty much going to be the same, uh, but we'll get into the physical battle here and more background information on the commanders. So one of the most underrated and uh, underappreciated generals in American Air Force history, in my personal opinion, General George Churchill Kenney. He's going to be the commander under MacArthur for all of MacArthur's air forces in the Southwest Pacific area. This is a guy of innovation. This is a general who has come up through the Air Corps Tactical School, at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, and uh, he's a World War I veteran. Uh, he actually gets into some dogfights with German fighters, and he gets his combat experience through that, and then uh, ends up lecturing on attack aviation. So if anybody's ever heard about the bomber mafia, right, those guys who want to participate in, in daylight, high altitude, precision bombing with heavy bombers loaded to the teeth with machine guns to get through the fighters without escort. And they're just going to bomb uh, industrial facilities, anything that keeps the vital arteries of the warring nation going. And they're going to try and advocate for a separate air force through the use of this high altitude precision bombing doctrine that they're developing from the bomber mafia at Maxwell. Well, General Kenny isn't really a part of that. He, he's part of the attack aviation hub, right? He's trying to develop, how do I learn from these tactical aircraft, smaller aircraft that can still deliver a good punch to support the guys on the ground directly and attack the enemy forces in the field, right? This is going to come in handy, right? So he has a technical background. He's very smart. He's wicked smart. He's from MIT. That's where he got his, his degree. He uh, starts working in the material command for the Army Air Forces at the time. He starts developing acquisitions and developing airframes, and he knows how to fly, and he knows how to fix. So it makes him a lot more apt to trying to innovate on the fly, which will come in handy later, whatever weapon systems that he's given at that time to meet the objective, right? So he's inspiring new ways of thinking amongst his members underneath as well, right? So his subordinates down to the junior officer level, like me, I mean, if I was flying a B-25 at that point, I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, if I was there and he said, hey, Lieutenant, what do you think? He's that kind of general, right? He's going to walk up to you and ask you what you think about things. And I would have been like, hey, maybe we should strap some more 50 cal machine guns to the nose of my B-25. I didn't say that, but, you know, um, he's going to inspire people from the bottom up, right? But he's also going to deal with some bureaucratic resistance. There's no innovation without that. There's always going to be guys that are going to stick to the status quo and stick to the defined peacetime doctrine. And one of those subordinates that he had to deal with that was among them, uh, Brigadier General Kenneth N. Walker. He's the commander of 5th Bomber Command. So he's in charge of the bombers. Pretty important job, right? He is unfortunately going to be killed in action on 5 January 1943 before the Battle of Bismarck Sea, flying a uh, dozen, uh, about six B-17, 6B-24 is over a daylight raid over Rabaul, and he's going to be bombing the shipping in the harbor. Uh, he's trying to prove the high altitude precision uh, bombing theory. Now, the Pacific is in Europe, right? Uh, Europe has, you know, you, you're sending 300, 400 bombers at a time from multiple altitudes, multiple vectors, and, and attacking a factory complex in Gdynia or Stuttgart or something like that. You're going to suffer high losses. There's going to be high anti-aircraft fire. Well, in the Pacific, it's a different kind of war, right? I mean, what, what factory are you going to hit in New Britain, right? What kind of, what kind of uh, you, you know, you might have an oil refinery or an airfield or something like that. But this high altitude thing against ships, it's just not going to work. It's, you have to have the active cooperation from the guy 
actually steering the ship below you to hit him almost right if you can't saturate the area with bombs you got to have that guy actually want to get hit steer into it so that just that's just not going to work for the pacific so general kenny has to come up with a way to get behind all of that right get around that use what he has to best effect against the enemy in the field so comes to tactics right it's all about tactics once you have a piece of equipment that just isn't doing it the way that you designed it to do it Air Corps Tactical School, we talked about that, right? All these guys are talking about high precision, high altitude bombing. It's not going to work for the Pacific. You got to come in low. You got to come in low and you have to be able to deal with the anti aircraft fire. Well, this is how they do it. They hire a guy named uh, Pappy Gunn. Um, he's uh, going to be, he's a kind of interesting character. He was formerly in the Navy. Uh, he ends up in the Philippines in 1941, gets promoted to captain and commissioned immediately to fly a little air service out of the Philippines. He is an innovator too. Uh, Pappy Gunn is an innovator when, when it comes to creating what we know now as the gunship, right? He's going to take these B-25s like you can see in this picture right here, uh, B-25s and turn them into, you know, six gun, uh, low level attack aircraft that are going to be able to sweep the deck of the escorting destroyers and any, any aircraft guns that the transports have while they're delivering the weapons. So he's killing two birds at one stone in this, right? He's adding so much firepower to the weapon system that he's able to suppress the flak as he's going in low and then release his weapons so that it reduces the risk to the crew of being shot down on the way in low level, right? Kind of makes you think of the torpedo bombers at Midway. They wish they could have had that kind of deal, you know, a little bit more firepower. But overall, at Midway and Guadalcanal in these campaigns, the Army Air Corps just wasn't performing up to its standards that General Billy Mitchell in the 1920s was trying to promote. Right, the entire idea of having a separate land-based air force was to be able to prove that we can sink ships from land-based air power, long-range bombers. Just wasn't working in Midway and at Guadalcanal. It wasn't working as effectively as we wanted it to. So we had to take what we had in the Southwest Pacific, which wasn't a lot compared to the rest of the globe at that time, and use it to maximum effect to destroy the enemy. And that's exactly what General Kenny was able to do by developing skip bombing. Right. Skip bombing wasn't originally an American idea, but we used it at the Bismarck Sea for the first time in mass to affect the battle space in a dramatic way. And this is a picture of a B-25 practicing skip bombing on the SS Perth. That's a transport ship that's uh, sunk and still above the waterline off of Port Moresby. And this kind of this picture really makes me think of how we train today for practice like you play. Right. If you're you know, if you're training on an airframe, you're training on, uh, you know, a weapon system, it behooves you to train the way that you play so that when you actually get into the game, you're going to be performing the way that you were performing in practice, right? You can't reinforce bad habits. And this is what these guys are trying to solve for the battle that was coming up in March 1943. So the overall battle here, I can go through March 2nd, I can go through March 4th, I can go through March 1st. March 3rd is the real absolute tipping point for the battle where the most damage is done and if i'm going to describe this any you know in, in any way i just read you this small paragraph from eagle against the sun arnold specter or ronald h specter great author great historian and this section right here pretty much describes it all so from eagle against the sun this is pages 227 and 228 if anybody's interesting and interested in getting the book i'm putting a plug in for it. it's a great book um, and, he's, and he quotes, as the Japanese convoy was nearing Cape Gloucester, the western tip of New Britain Island, it was attacked by two flights of high-flying B-17s, which sank a transport. Lucky shot. A second attack by 11 more B-17s left another ship sinking. Nice. Two sorties, two ships. That's not bad for B-17s, guys. The following morning, the convoy entered the Dampier Strait near New Guinea and New Britain, within range of Allied fighters and medium bombers. At mid-morning, lookouts on the Japanese ships stared in surprise at, and apprehension at the black shapes of nearly 100 Allied planes, including 30 of the modified B-25s, closing rapidly from the south. So those are the upgun gunships that Pappy Gun was putting all the guns on. Those are the B-25s that we're talking about. They're going to do a lot of damage coming up right here. Japanese fighters covering the convoy remained at high in the sky, waiting for the usual high-level B-17 attacks and so missed the B-25s and A-20s and Australian bow fighters, which came in skimming the water so low and straight that the Japanese sailors thought they were being attacked by torpedo planes. This is key. 
The Japanese thought that we were employing a commonly used strategy of torpedoes. Not today, right? We're doing skip bombing, right? So they're not expecting us coming in from low altitude. They got their fighters at high altitude waiting for the B-17s and 24s at high level to come in. Perfect setup. So when the Allied attackers roared over the slow moving formation at mast head level, raining death on the crowded decks of the transports. So this is where the machine guns are coming in, clearing the decks of the anti-aircraft gunners so no one can fire at them. And they're coming in at mass height level and they're dropping their bombs to skip bomb right into the side of the ship. By the end of the day, all the remaining transports and four of the eight destroyers were sunk or sinking. Ouch. Allied planes and PT boats roamed the strait, shooting up the survivors, clinging to life rafts or debris. By 1943, the Japanese pretty much showed us they're not going to surrender. So it makes sense if they're going to get on shore and they're going to you know, take part in the frontal defense of New Guinea, we can't let that happen. Where am I? Oh, here we go. Since Japanese troops did not surrender, they had to be killed to prevent them from making landfall in New Guinea and possibly joining their comrades there. At least that was the reasoning. Almost 3,000 troops in all, including most of the experienced officers of the 51st Division, were lost. Kenny's planes had finally achieved what General Billy Mitchell had so brazenly predicted 15 years before. So it took a long time and it took over two years of active combat to get us to this point where we innovated to actually hitting the targets at sea from land-based air power. So some quick lessons, right? I'm gonna get through these a little quick because I think I'm running out of time here. So after the battle, the Japanese never really seriously tried to reinforce that position of New Guinea. That was pretty much done. And then this set a standard attack profile, right? This proved a point to not only the Air Force, but to the Navy, to the Joint Staff, right, to the Combined Arms Force, that we can do this. We don't need a surface force to intercept a convoy. We can hit it from the air in mass and destroy it completely. Eight out of eight transports. I mean, that was, that was pretty good shooting, right? And the escorts that are going to be vitally needed by Japan to guard the rest of the merchant ships trying to send the resources back to Japan, right? And then this just illustrates if you attack from multiple vectors, multiple altitudes at the same time, using different ordnance, different assets that confuse the enemy defense, that's going to really drive home that saturation attack against an amphibious assault force, right? That's what we're kind of getting into now with our, our viewpoint of where we're going to go into the 21st century. So what are my, what, what do I see as the futures for land-based counter maritime, right? So a change in branch cultural mindset to meet the enemy's joint mindset, right? So the Chinese in the People's Liberation Army, which is split up into the various branches, why they name it the People's Liberation Army, Navy, Air Force, right? I don't know why they do that. But they have a joint mindset when it comes to their plan of attack, right? When it comes to their joint doctrine, when it comes to their ability to saturate a battle space and commit to that invasion of, China, of Taiwan, that cross-channel invasion, that's the worst case scenario and very active in the news right now. They have this cultural mindset of it doesn't matter really what branch does what it needs to do or what we need to do. All that matters is that it gets done. That's that's what we really kind of go for here with this joint mindset, right? Just because it's a naval campaign doesn't mean the Air Force doesn't have a role to play. And that's an Air Force mindset we need to try and try and key in, especially with uh, the younger generation coming up. It's not all counterinsurgency that's always going to be there. But that worst case scenario is going to come into play pretty quick, and it might come sooner than you think. So a Davidson window, Admiral Davidson got in front of the Senate and, and basically said, hey, I've been out here in the field. I've been out here in Indo-PACOM. I'm seeing stuff that is pretty much is scaring the heck out of me. And we need to be prepared for the Chinese to do this cross-channel invasion sooner than we were prepared to, right? The Davidson window, right? He, he believes that the, the time is running out for the Chinese to make a decision and uh, it doesn't look good, right? So we need to prepare for this kind of thing with what we have now. Uh, procurement timetables and future force structure. Um, really what, what we're talking about there is, you know, you can develop something for 10 years down the line. You can get into acquisitions process and throw money at a problem and develop this, this thing that's going to be awesome 10 years from now. But what are you going to do tonight? Right? What, what, are you, what are you going to do tomorrow if the PLA decides to go to their ports, their amphibious assault brigades get in, in, in their uh, Type 75, Type 71, Type 72 landing assault ships, and they go. What are you going to do, right? Like, like, what are you going to do with the assets that you have? Are you going to be able to 
have everything that you have in your inventory play a part in that dance? If, if you don't know, we need to ask ourselves those hard questions and develop those TTPs for right now. So that when now comes, we're, we're like, okay, you know, we can do this, right? And that, and that develops deterrence, right? If Beijing can see that and they can see a little bit of, oh, the Americans are prepared to use their stuff, not just in a counterinsurgency role, but they're able to adapt their pieces of equipment that they have right now to us. Hmm, maybe we should rethink it. Maybe we should move that timetable to the right a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. That's how you avoid a war, right? And then 10 years from now, that new stuff comes online. Oh, that's great. You know, hey, get that, get whatever the old stuff is out of there and put that new stuff in. That's, that's awesome. But you can't solely focus on that procurement process to help you in 10 years. And this is going to be a war of missiles, right? It's going to be a missile saturation guided, uh, a really smart pieces of equipment that are going to be trying to track and find you, right? And they're going to be, be able to find out where you are, what you are, and be able to terminally glide and get you very quickly and saturate the area, right? And then biggest thing, destroying the amphibious force, right? This is going to be a political defeat for the PLA if they can't land the guys that they've trained for years to do this, right? The amphibious assault brigades from the PLA, the Marine Corps assault brigades, they're training for years to do this cross-channel invasion. If you hit the amphibious assault ships, which if I have it correctly, one landing helicopter deck as of 2021 seven uh, landing trans transport docks and about roughly 13, 14 uh, type 72 LSTs. You start destroying those in large numbers, they're not gonna be able to resupply their guys. They're not gonna be able to land those special brigades, not to mention the beachhead is gonna be contested and pretty hot. So if you make those a joint priority of destruction, that's gonna be pretty effective, right? I mean, what, what's a destroyer gonna do about raising a red flag over type A? It's gonna be able to take a beach might be able to launch some missiles, yeah. But is it going to land Marines? I don't think so. Right? Stand and force structure have to be maintained and expanded, right? We have to have the stuff in the theater at the time within the first 12 hours to be able to respond. And then there needs to be a return of a joint bomber mafia, right? A This isn't just an Air Force thing. It has to be a Marine Corps thing. It has to be a Navy thing. It has to be a Space Force thing. It has to be an Air Force thing. It has to be a joint mentality of what assets do we have how can we saturate the battle space and destroy that amphibious force very quickly? And then here's just some, some conclusions that, that basically parrot what I just talked about. The, the biggest thing here that, that I want to emphasize is the what ifs, right? You got to ask yourself, what if we don't have air superiority? Are we allowed to ask that? What if, what if that whole you know, fighter thing doesn't work out? How are we going to still impact the battle space from long range precision strike from air power, land based air power? I mean, what if, what if the enemy does get a vote, right? What, what, if, what if they do cast their ballot and it comes out on their side and they've got air parity and we've got air contested over Taiwan? It's not guaranteed, right? It has to be fought for. And until those bullets start flying for the first time, you're never going to really know how your stuff is going to perform. You can war game it all you want, but when the bullets start flying, that's when you really have your real test, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid here. So you have to have backup plans to your backup plans. You always have to have a fallback position where you can still influence the battle space in an effective way by destroying that amphibious assault force, right? Weapon stocks uh, also need to go up. I mean, we see that problem right now with Ukraine. Uh, long range anti-ship missiles, we gotta have more of them, right? 450 is great, but after two weeks of combat, you fired off a bunch of them and the Chinese point defense has destroyed maybe 30%. Okay, well, where, where are the rest of your missiles, right? You can't get back to an assembly line and be like, hey, we need more of these, right? That's not really how our system works right now. So we need to have more of those, definitely more of those. And then uh, here are the sources, uh, stuff I used. And then uh, I'd be happy to take any questions in the, in the chat room. Uh, looks like we got, okay. Yep. And then any, any questions or anything like that, be happy to answer. And then with that, I will uh, close it out and then hand it off. Next up is uh, Brendan, Lieutenant Donnelly. I, so I assume he's calling up his slides. 
You would be correct. I can't be an Intel officer without having slides. <laughs> it's all yours. Awesome. Well, I think um, to kind of carry on what Grant was talking about in, in extension, kind of what Chris was talking about from the very beginning, is it's it's very evident that the battle space that we're talking about, uh, ergo the, the Pacific warfare, uh, includes two things that are kind of the biggest problem. It was one joint warfare in, in uh, geographic concerns. So Grant hit it uh, extraordinarily well about why this is such a joint problem, talking about different factors. I'm going to be kind of carrying that into uh, adding in a little bit more of a intelligence piece. So as an Intel officer myself, um, uh, that's kind of why Grant and I work so well together is uh, he has a lot of the tactic side. So what I would call the operation side, and I bring a lot of the intelligence portion to the table. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea um, and overall what military intelligence can provide to the Pacific Theater. Um, I think the reason why I also chose uh, to discuss the, the Battle of the Coral Sea is because a lot of the time when talking about World War II uh, in the Pacific Theater, um, a lot of people talk about Midway. Um, so that's really the big one, especially when it comes to carriers. Uh, Midway is that big battle where we have to show off of multiple carriers again, from, the, from the Japanese to the United States. And basically it's the turning point of the war. But I almost argue to the point where the Coral Sea was that, that predecessor battle that led to Midway. And that's where we see a lot of the intelligence coming in. That's where we also see um, for the first time intelligence impact, not only one of the first carrier battles, but also where Intel's really coming into play uh, throughout that theater. Uh, so as, as a little quick background of myself, um, the reason why I consider myself even worthy to talk about intelligence is because I went through intelligence tech school and I've been all around the world in terms of doing intelligence. But uh, the big thing is uh, I'm going to go over kind of what the, the Battle of Coral Sea was really looking like, uh, the key historic takeaways, and then how we're actually going to you know, apply those today. But um, to kind of carry on what we were just talking about in terms of the geographic side, and that's why I have that on the slide there is the scope that we're talking about in terms of where the Japanese were versus where the United States was in World War II is the whole reason why Coral Sea even went down was because the Japanese were going after Port Moresby. So I thought it was a little bit uh, funny that uh, Grant brought up the, uh, the ship that was on the beaches right by Port Moresby. So exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but the Japanese were trying to get this, uh, this port in order to cut off any kind of support the United States was providing to the Australians. Um, because basically at this point in that, on that map, you can see towards the Southern portion, towards the Coral Sea, South of the Solomon Islands, uh, mainly the US bases were, were very geographically separated from everything else uh, that we had towards the North and the Solomon Sea. So the Japanese were trying to cut that off. Uh, also, I, I, I also wanna talk about how it's not just a joint battle, um, but the United States during World War II had a very, what we would call coalition battle, uh, is it wasn't just the United States that, was, that, were, that we were uh, fighting the war with. The Australians um, in that uh, southwestern portion um, of the slide and more of like the northeastern portion of Australia and Queensland, those two air bases uh, in Australia were critical for the United States to have uh, reconnaissance aircraft flying in the Coral Sea up to the Solomon Sea. Uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit more, but that's kind of following that overall general uh, guideline of the geographically separated areas. That's one of the biggest obstacles when you're talking about Indo-PACOM. It covers a huge area of just the surface of the earth. And so that's why it is realistically one of the more complicated things to discuss. Um, at the beginning of the, of the battle, I think the, the, the things that I want to really call out uh, are just the aircraft that we were going up against in Coral Sea during World War II. So we had the Zukaku, the Shokaku, and the Shoho. Uh, so the Japanese had quite a few more aircraft in the United States, but we also did have the USX York, uh, Lexington and Yorktown. Um, the other things, uh, I know that I listed the aircraft in terms of the fighter bombers, the, the bombers and the fleet and the seaplanes, but what I'm really going to be focusing on are the reconnaissance aircraft. So yes, uh, kind of like what Grant was talking about before, you have to have these different tactics when you're talking about fighters, bombers uh, against a naval adversary. But especially in World War II, you needed another way to actually find where these um, ships were, wherever these vessels were. Uh, you, that is where kind of intelligence comes in with signals intelligence. Um, 
where uh, a lot of the adversary was talking about, okay, we're moving the ships here. They're going to pass those back to the Japanese government. Um, and being able to intercept those, I'll be talking about a little bit later. But the other thing was the big difference was the Imperial Japanese Navy at this point in time. They didn't use uh, reconnaissance aircraft from their own uh, naval vessels. These were, these were all going to be land-based. But on the other side, the combined allied fleets of the United States and the Australians, we were using land-based Australian uh, reconnaissance aircraft that were communicating with uh, the Task Force 17. And then also the United States used airborne and surface-based from our own aircraft carriers, reconnaissance aircraft as well, uh, which we'll see a little bit later on once we get to the, the actual outlay of what Coral Sea looked like, why that really impacted the battle itself. But the absolute first thing is the port, the, the purpose, as I already mentioned, was going for Port Moresby. So you can see that uh, towards the northwestern portion. But the first thing is, as we saw the, uh, the strike force um, from the Japanese, they were moving around uh, in the Solomon Sea. The first thing that we were able to identify is by using intelligence uh, and by using reconnaissance aircraft uh, and overall early warning, uh, the USS York time was actually able to go up and attack one of the locations in Tulagi that the Japanese were currently attacking. And so that was one way, or at least the first instance in which uh, early warning detections were able to actually uh, tip off the United States. We were able to do a preliminary attack. And by the time that uh, the USS Yorktown came around, the task force from the, from the Japanese came around the corner and the USS Yorktown was already too far south to even be detected or even to be engaged by any of the Japanese aircraft. Uh, moving forward, we then had uh, towards the southern portion and to the north uh, northwest. This is where we had two kind of simultaneous attacks and where reconnaissance aircraft came in, is uh, land-based Japanese uh, aircraft were able to find that there were um, uh, US, uh, there was actually a tanker and a, a support ship that were towards the south not even actually close to where the actual uh, rest of the task force was, so where the USS Yorktown and Lexington were. But almost simultaneously, uh, the, York, the Yorktown and the Lexington were able to also find where the, the Shoho was. So both instances though, the intelligence was incorrect. The reconnaissance aircraft, they were very antsy. They were saying, all right, where the Shoho actually was, that was where the, Jap where, uh, the United States understood that that was where the main Japanese force was which as we know now, uh, post-battle was incorrect, but the exact same thing almost happened simultaneously in terms of the battlefield, where the Japanese also thought that they had the main um, US force towards the South. And that's where we saw the carriers unleash massive amounts of aircraft trying to attack those. And that is where uh, we saw the USS Sims and the USS Neosho uh, sunk, but then that's what also where we saw the show host sunk as well. So those are the two most more critical attacks that we saw uh, large, more strategic vessels that were uh, being sunk. But then we actually moved on later into the battle where the intelligence was actually correct. This was the first time that we saw the Japanese used, um, uh, they actually went against their own general tactics and they used uh, reconnaissance aircraft based off or basically coming from their own carrier strike group. And that is where they, and they identified uh, the, the Lexington and the Yorktown. And at the same time, the land-based reconnaissance aircraft and the surface-based reconnaissance aircraft found uh, the Japanese force at the same time. Um, so this is where that first carrier battle came into play, uh, where we saw them almost attack simultaneously. And then after the battle, that was where we saw that them both retreat. So this was uh, where the United States launched 75 planes and the uh, Imperial Japanese Naval, Navy launched 69 planes. Uh, basically, once the scuffle was over, uh, this was realistically what we saw. The Lexington was sunk and the Osho was sunk and the Sims were sunk. So in terms of overall tonnage of aircraft, you could consider this a United States loss um, just because there were much larger ships that were lost. But in terms of a strategic view, um, at this point in time, the other ships uh, that were in, so the Ziukaku and the Shokaku, uh, they were also damaged during this battle. They weren't sunk, but it did take out these uh, aircraft carriers from the Battle of Midway. So instead of the United States having to take on four, or sorry, instead of having to take on six uh, aircraft carriers from the Japanese side, they only had to take on four for the Battle of Midway. 
So even though it's kind of like that old adage of sometimes you just uh, you win the war, but you lose a battle, that's totally fine. And that's where we kind of exactly saw exactly that is the United States lost this battle, but we won the battle of Midway later on. And that's where that's why I argue, and that's my personal view, that the Coral Sea is such a strategic and important battle because without this, who knows what would have happened at Midway if we were going uh, against six aircraft carriers instead of four. But um, the big thing that I wanted to talk about was the signals intelligence, so the challenges and outcomes. Um, so this realistically looked like, uh, and I'm gonna kind of talk to this right now, the bottom portion right there is that the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, uh, it was the Battle of the Coral Sea that signals intelligence came of age, demonstrating its capacity to predict the enemy's intentions uh, will in advance and with remarkable accuracy. Uh, so that's one of the books that I used was from Codebreakers 2017. And the big thing that we're looking at is uh, at this point in time, signals intelligence was not effective. It wasn't uh, a strong suit for either side. Uh, this was at the very beginning of what signals intelligence was. But uh, the United States at this point in time was only able to, to decipher about or actually intercept about 60% of the Japanese naval traffic of where the assets were going to be, uh, where the vessels were going to be traveling. 40% uh, of that could actually be analyzed. And only about 10 to 15% of what the United States was able to intercept actually was useful information. Locations of vessels. Other than that, it was mostly just uh, what you would call fluff, um, talking about things that the United States really didn't care about. Uh, it could have been diplomatic uh, notifications. But the reason for this was because of the complicated code that the Japanese were using. So unlike in the Eastern side with Enigma, I'm sure everybody's seen Imitation Game, um, but JN25 was that double encrypted uh, military or, or military signal that the Japanese was using. Um, so in terms of kind of talking about the coalition side again, uh, military intelligence, so MI6, um, the Australian SI, or SWS, so the Australian Special War, uh, Wireless Section, and the SIS, so which is what is considered the predecessor of the NSA, those three organizations had to work together to actually even get to that 10 to 15% of what the, unit, the, the US Navy was even using. Um, based on that 10 to 15%, the outcomes that we were looking at was a slight ability to track where the Japanese vessels were. And that is where that comes into play in Coral Sea is if it, originally there was a very small section uh, of decoded intelligence that uh, basically stated that there were going to, there's going to be some kind of uh, increase in Japanese naval activity towards what was then deciphered as Port Moresby. So we were able to then send the Yorktown and Lexington. Uh, we were able to provide some types of indications of large offensive actions using signals intelligence, potential targets, uh, diplomatic messages between the Japanese uh, and the Germans at the time, and then any kind of key leader movements and locations. So that's where signals intelligence uh, even though it was in its infancy, uh, we saw large outcomes, even though that we had upwards of, uh, even at our best day, 15% uh, of what the Japanese were actually talking about. Um, so the historic takeaways that we can really get from how the battle actually took place, um, how signals intelligence really comes into play, is the big thing is the, the fight took on a multidimensional warfare stage. And so when I say multidimensional, I mean uh, you had vessels on the surface level, you had aircraft in the air, and then what you would consider just kind of like in the vast emptiness around all of that is the other multidimensional part, which is intelligence collection. Um, that, so that moves on to the impact of signals intelligence on the war. So without this, uh, we could have completely lost Port Moresby, uh, completely even cut off from our Australian ties. Uh, being able to provide the Australians was a significant impact in how the Australians were able to support us in the war. So as an intelligence officer, I could say, or I could argue that signals intelligence was one of those things that was able to give us that key tick into, hey, this is what's about to happen. Now you better react and you better trust your intelligence. Uh, and that's going to be able to be that saving grace. Um, on, along with signals intelligence, I also consider this uh, partly an intelligence function as those reconnaissance aircraft, being able to identify where those uh, aircraft carriers were 
at this point in time, Radar, uh, to also throw in something new, Radar was in its infancy as well. It was not very uh, efficient and it wasn't very specific of where things were located. So those reconnaissance aircraft being able to provide that real time or uh, near real time intelligence was as, as good as we can get now uh, in uh, the 21st century. We have much better reconnaissance aircraft, but they they used what they could do or what what they had back in World War II. So that those reconnaissance aircraft were able to provide uh, as best targeting locations as possible, and then overlapping defense and offensive capabilities. So um, the Japanese during the during the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, they mainly used the air defenses that were on the aircraft carriers themselves. Every all every other ship was uh, kind of pushed to the side to make sure that there was some room for the aircraft carriers to maneuver. But that was very much unlike what the United States did. And how we organized that is all of the air defenses, all of the different uh, anti-aircraft guns that were around those aircraft carriers were able to shoot down any of the uh, Japanese aircraft that were coming in. So I can talk about that a little bit on the next slide for the, what we need to be concerned about now is because overlapping defense and kind of like what Crank was talking about before of that we have to have all of these things in place now. That is realistically what I'm talking about when it, when it comes to that is we need to have overlapping defense and offensive capabilities at the locations now. So kind of how we're gonna be applying all of these lessons from the Coral Sea, I know that uh, technology, aircraft, whatever you would like to talk about uh, has advanced greatly since World War II, but those basic lessons that we were just talking about uh, can be a play can in be in play today. Uh, so for intelligence capabilities, um, the domains have now increased. So unlike Coral Sea, where it was the surface level, the air level, and just intelligence in general, we're now facing um, a threat such as China that we now have to talk about maritime surveillance, kind of like what Grant hit on, um, cyber collection, space-based collection, airborne ISR. So the the overall multi-dimensional side of things has just become even more vast. That is even more of a way of saying like that, uh, kind of like what Chris was talking about is this is how we can learn from Coral Sea is that it was effective in defending our own assets because we had that overlapping coverage and that uh, um, multi-dimensional joint and actually coalition, coalition outlook. That is what we now need to do. Is uh, so in the uh, in the Indo-PACOM region. I'm sure people have heard of AUKUS, so the AUKUS uh, agreement. Those kinds of multinational coalition joint efforts are what we really need to look at. Look at because if it worked in Coral Sea, we're looking at that as now advancing what we're going to be doing in terms of multinational and joint operations. Now, uh, Grant kind of hit on it with the with the missile systems as well. So having that overlap overlapping defensive systems, um, sticking with how we were defending our aircraft carriers, every asset that we have, those are some of the biggest um, assets that we have in the Indo-PACOM region. I mean, they're moving cities. They're, they're billions and billions of dollars. They have tons of aircraft and the, the vessels that even move with them have tons of capabilities that can really defend and provide that defense, but also provide that offense that we really need. The reason why we need this though, is because of uh, if we can't defend ourselves and we can't defend our partners. And that's where I really wanna hit home on that multinational partnerships. I know that uh, Jose is gonna be talking about the Philippines later. Uh, and he's also very big in, into the, the Philippines defense, but not only the Philippines, but Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and Australia are big partners uh, because you can see at the, at the bottom of the slide there about the different island chains that we're gonna be faced up against. Right now, the defenses in the first island chain pretty solid in terms of what the Chinese are able to do. Uh, but if we're gonna have a large scale conflict, kind of like where the United States was using some of our coalition uh, assets and vessels way back when in World War II, we're gonna have to call upon some of the same allies to assist in, in um, defending and have providing some of those offense capabilities all the way into the second island chain, which is even past the Philippines. So that vast geographic area is not only joint, it's coalition. We we have to have those other coalition partners or else um, it's gonna be a, a real tough fight uphill against a, a ally that doesn't even have to fight across an ocean. China's right there, we're fighting on their turf. Um, so that's one of the biggest out, um, uh, difficulties that we're gonna be facing as well. 
But uh, in terms of uh, the lessons learned I, at this point in time, if there's any comments or questions that anybody has for myself on kind of how intelligence is going to be a huge factor in what we're going to be playing in the Indo-Pacific region, I'm more than happy to take those as well. Um, I will give this one little push of that uh, as an intelligence officer, uh, one of the big things I always find as one of the more amazing things is how much unclassified information is out there. All of this information and all of these opinions are from reading unclassified books, unclassified material from different news sources and different things, different countries even. Um, so I, I, I guess I implore everybody to, to really look at uh, different, um, what I call open source, but unclassified resources. Grant and I were just talking about that in a paper that we that we had published about the Ukrainian war, but it's realistically for every domain um, that all of these uh, opinions of myself uh, can be presented just by unclassified uh, material. So if there aren't are any questions, then I can pass it over to Chris and then move on to Jose, but thank you so much. Thanks, Brendan. We'll actually uh, do questions and any discussion at the, at the very end. Um, and so with that, I will throw it over to Jose um, for, for your part of the presentation. And then once you're done, we'll bring it back. And if we have any questions or any discussion, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up after that. So Jose, you're up. Hello, yes. So let me just figure this out, technical stuff. Uh, okay, so slideshow, right? Uh, share screen. Share screen. What am I supposed to do there? Share. Okay, then uh, slideshow. There. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. There. Okay, there. Okay, so my uh, presentation is uh, going to be on Manila to Malawi urban combat in the Philippines. Okay. Um, apologies, my slides failed in comparison to the two other slides a while ago. I cannot be an intelligence officer. Sorry. So anyway, <laughs> so, anyway. so five years ago, uh, the Battle of Malawi brought about, brought about renewed interest in the subject of urban warfare. From May 23 to October 23, 2017, or five months, Fighting went on in the capital of Lanao del Sur, where an ad hoc mix of local and foreign gunmen managed to hang on to parts of Marawi before being overwhelmed by uh, Philippine, uh, by the Philippine government, okay? by Philippine government troops. Okay? Um, questions posed by observers as to why that battle lasted so long became a source of national discussion, whether in media or in government circles. These questions may be answered in part fully revisited when 72 years ago where in a battle was fought in the urban area of Manila. Fighting in towns and cities is one of the more difficult operations to do. The clusters of buildings that are typically of a densely populated town or city and the large numbers of civilians makes it ideal for defense no matter how numerically inferior or ill-equipped it is. Throughout history, formidable armies that have previously swept everything before them have floundered in the streets of urban areas. Their advance slow to a crawl while the casualties piled up from pinprick attacks of an elusive enemy. So we don't we have a lot of examples of that. In a way, the fear of urban areas could be or built up areas could be ascribed to the British and French uh, miracle of Dunkirk. Okay, the, 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 so, so the Philippines is no stranger to urban battles. There have been a number of um, uh, there have been a number of uh, battles fought in towns and cities in the Philippines, starting from the Philippine-American War, okay, that was in the 19th century, up to the present. The largest urban battle in Philippine history is the Battle for the Liberation of Manila from February 3, 1945, up to March 3, 1945, three, um, three uh, a month. The towns of Cebu and Baguio were also the site of battles in 1945, following the war battles in towns and urban areas have regularly occurred in the Philippines. Um, to name a few, those are the Battle of Holo in 1974, and then the coup attempts when the Philippine military fought each other in the streets of Manila in 1987 and in 1989. The 1989 coup attempt is significant because uh, when the battle seemed to be swinging uh, uh, in favor of the coup, of the coup, um, the coup plotters, the U.S. government sent F-4 phantoms to intervene uh, in, uh, 
to assist the, the administration of Cory Aquino, the president then. During the war on terrorism, there's, okay, so um, then in 2013, ragtag elements of the Moro National Liberation Front. There was, so there was a large gap. And then and the, the next uh, urban battle happened in 2013 when ragtag elements of the Moro National Liberation Front staged an assault on the city of Zamwanga, which then resulted in a 20-day battle for government troops before government troops were able to defeat them. So this was the first time since 1989 that the large-scale large fighting broke out in a major population center in the Philippines. Um, so there were failures of intelligence were cited because of the cause of the battle. It, however, revealed certain matters that exposed the weaknesses of government measures against terrorists and rebel attacks. Um, the first was that the, the police, because of its nature, could not be relied upon to counter most rebel attacks. And second, that the matter is that the military would need time to deploy because the Philippine military is deployed for counterinsurgency. So meaning to say that troops are spread out. Rarely does the military operate on division level or brigade or division level or even battalion level. These battalions are spread out. Um, so it takes slow, it takes, it, it takes, um, it's a, so these moments when the rebels attack, the initiative is used with the rebels, and then it's a slow response to gather forces from the, by the government to respond to them. Now they're, because of the Battle of Marawi, they've been changing uh, and making their uh, their forces more responsive, more able to respond to such attacks. Um, so the target rich environment of assaulting a large urban area and the prestige associated with attacking such a target caused the shift in strategies among uh, the rebels and of course the terrorists. One would surmise that given these numerous urban battles that there would be a vast amount of literature Unfortunately, it's, it's very scarce. You know, you'd, you'd think that with all of the battles happening in the Philippines, you'd have, you'd have a, you'd have a lot of scholarly work on it. Barely, actually. Um, but in contrast, that's what the, in contrast, Ameri Americans have managed to keep voluminous records of their battles in urban areas, including that of the Battle of Manila, and that is frequently accessed as sources when the need arises. So the purpose of then of this. Um, presentation is to um, see if there's any similarity between the two separate battles that will serve as a starting point for lessons learned in urban warfare, which is the Battle of Manila and the Battle of um, Marawi. So the city of Manila, the Battle of Manila was fought from February 3, as I mentioned, and pitted an estimated 60,000 uh, 50,000 Filipino and American troops and guerrillas against 16,000 Japanese troops. Um, of varying liability dug in, in the southern half of the city, mostly dug in, in the southern half of the city. So yeah, uh, just to look at the map here, you will see here that Manila is, uh, this is the city of Manila, then Manila is over there. And then this is a larger view of Manila and you will see a river divides the city into two halves, okay? A one is the, um, the, the, of course, the northern and the southern half. The concentration of fighting was here in the southern half of the city. At that time, the, city, the population of the city was said to number in between 8 to 100,000 civilians to a million. Okay. But because of uh, the war, uh, it was said that there were a number of civilians who were leaving the city already, going to the provinces, but many had nowhere else to go, so they were stuck there. That is why by 1945, there was, even before the battle, there was starvation already happening in the city and there were people who were um, dying on the city streets. Um, now, a feature of the city of Manila is that uh, it's a product of two colonial powers, basically, okay? the, the modern city of Manila. One is the Spaniards uh, who constructed uh, uh, fortifications. And then the second would be the, of course, the Americans. Okay, uh, who uh, modernized what the Spaniards started in and established a network of huge earthquake resistant government uh, buildings. And then at the same time, you would have um, houses constructed also of very strong material, okay? concrete, uh, stone, and uh, other such. So it's, it's a 
it's um it's direct opposite visiting the United States, for example, me visiting the United States, I am shocked at how fragile your houses are here as compared to Philippine houses, which tend to be rainforest concrete. Okay, uh, It's just gets bad when there's an earthquake in our side. More people get killed because of that. Uh, uh, so, uh, now, this population that I was mentioning, it of course became a problem when the battle began, uh, occurred because they were either victims of uh, Japanese atrocities or they were caught in the crossfire. Now, conduct of the battle. Um, on January 30, okay, uh, a few days fresh from the demarcation of the 1st Cavalry Division, General MacArthur mentioned to the 14th Corps Commander General Griswold to send a, a uh, task force, a, a mobile unit to make the 100 mile dash towards Manila. What was so, what was important about that was the great un, um, underestimation of the Japanese capabilities there. Uh, it showed that um, there were inadequacies of American intelligence. Um, because they underestimated what was facing them. They didn't, they weren't, they were confused if there was going to be a battle or not. They were getting a lot of information uh, of data that the um, that the um, Japanese were withdrawing to either the mountains east of Manila or to the mountains nor um, in the north, northern Luzon. Um, the thing is that uh, they were also not being. Uh, convinced about guerrilla reports because, yeah, there was a large sympathetic population there. There were there were a lot of conflicting reports coming out. So uh, many American commanders didn't exactly have a clear picture of what was going on. So when the, the uh, but the the reason why that flying column was sent towards Manila was of course to rescue uh, American internees and others um, people who they suspected the Japanese would be uh, would. Uh, slaughter. Okay, uh, but at the same time, also to secure buildings. Okay, so again, uh, showing also how the, the United, uh, how the U.S. Army then uh, underestimated the strength of the city defenses of the Japanese. It was only when the um, uh, flying column tried to cross the Pasig River when they realized the full extent of the Japanese defenses when they were stopped they, uh, they were stopped um, at the vicinity of the what is now known as a Far Eastern University. Uh, they were trying to cross a bridge there, but they were stopped by the resistance there. Now, um, as the as the battle went on, the Manila was divided between two divisions that participated in that battle. One was the 37th Infantry Division. And the second one was the first cavalry division. So those were two divisions coming in from the 14th um, Corps. Uh, they, uh, the first division would be here in this general area, trying to push here. And then the first cavalry would make this swing. So you can see this, this uh, arrows here. That's, this, that's the, the um, route of a first cavalry division. There was a third division that was um, also uh, deployed to the battle, and that was the oops, sorry, that was the uh, 11th Airborne. Again, another glaring example of how uh, intelligence uh, of, um, of Japanese uh, intentions was um, really lacking. Why? Because the strongest American divisions were deployed up here in the north. They were pushing down. The weakest American unit, which was the Airborne Division, was coming from Batangas, which is not anymore in the map, okay, coming up from here. They were um, uh, actually running smack into the heaviest, heavy, uh, heaviest concentration of Japanese troops in the heavily defended uh, Genko Line, which was uh, up, uh, defending the southern approaches to Manila. So that was the situation then. So when the 11th Airborne reached that uh, this particular area, 
they were they were um, lucky enough to have a lot of guerrilla support for them. Okay, so um, if not for the guerrillas, the 11th Airborne would have a harder time making that advance from Batangas, the province down south, up towards uh, the southern approaches to the city. A lot of guerrilla units were protecting the flanks of that um, American division. Um, okay, so you have here, um, you have here uh, pictures of the Battle of Manila, and then as the battle as it um, occurred, and this is, of course, this is in this is near uh, Manila City Hall. But this was a type of artillery that the Japanese had, which they were um, uh, using against um, the Americans who were uh, attacking in the city. And of course, we, most of these were naval guns that were stripped from uh, warships and other uh, military vessels that were sunk in Manila Bay during the um, attacks by the American Air, Army Air Force, the US, Air, US Army Air Force in 1944 to early 1945. So as the ships were either damaged, the, the guns would be stripped and then they, uh, installed on in uh, fortifications and land. Okay. Now, um, so from not expecting resistance to finally getting embroiled in an urban air, in an urban battle that for the American army in the Pacific was not really used to because again, this was like a, this was a, an army that was um, accustomed to fighting in jungles or in small towns wherever, but to, to fight in, a, in, a, in an urban area, which was, actually a combination of Asian and European um, um, city you know, with uh, architecture that would be similar to what you would find in Washington, D.C., you know, would, would be um, something new for the, America, uh, for the Americans. And it was something that um, uh, would uh, be very difficult for them precisely because of the fact of the large civilian population there. That's why um, there was restrictions of the use of air power. So despite the fact that the um, allies had complete air suprem supremacy here, there was no Japanese Air Force worthy to, to um, uh, challenge it, there was restriction on the use of, of, um, air, pow of air power. Okay? There were instances where air power was used, but in places um, adjacent to the city. But in the city, uh, they used instead artillery. So this was the artillery that was used. Initially, uh, they tried to be very careful. So it's it's actually a myth that uh, they, because especially here in the Philippines, uh, there are pers there are um, accusations that the Americans were indiscriminate in their use of artillery, which was not really the case because there was there were there were a lot of measures being done to ensure that uh, civilians would not be hit by artillery fire. They tried, but again, that's 1940. And then 1945, and then at the same time, um, this intensive the fighting, plus the Japanese tendency to use human hostages, that resulted in a lot of uh, incidents where uh, civilians were killed by artillery fire. Um, many of these artillery pieces were used in direct fire roles. Okay? Uh, it was easy. It was uh, one thing that the Americans had in uh, was the ability to to adapt to situations. Okay, because if you look at the previous uh, presentations, a problem that the Japanese would usually have was an inability to adapt to change the situation. So, it would, but the, the Americans did. Uh, they, they they it was easier for them to adapt plus the fact that they were also lavishly equipped with uh, uh, weapons by 1945. And um, so you'd have the 240 millimeter howitzer being used. Um, and uh, of course this is in an indirect fire role, but eventually uh, they would use similar artillery in direct fire roles against the earthquake resistant buildings in Manila. 
then you would have, of course, the 105, the very, very popular 105 that up to now, it's still in service with the Philippine military. And some of them upgraded versions of the Vietnam model, issue, uh, model series were used in the Battle of Marawi. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, eventually, as the battle wore on, um, if you look here at the American, um, the American uh, tactic. So by by mid February, they had managed to seal off the city. Okay. Uh, American and Filipino guerrilla, American troops and Filipino guerrillas managed to seal off Manila, uh, Manila from either possible reinforcement from Shimbo Army Group, which was located here, and uh, to to prevent also uh, any reinforcement. Okay. Now, uh, uh, the this um, it's usually said that Iwabuchi was a crazed. Um, or an insane admiral. There are a lot of people who, who blame Iwabuchi for it. But actually, when you look at Iwabuchi's assessments of his fighting forces, which were a, which were a mixture of Japanese and of Japanese uh, special landing forces and uh, sailors and even civilians, he was well aware of the limitations of his forces. So instead of following orders from Shimbu to break out, which he could have done, uh, several weeks into the battle, he's, he argued that his forces will be better uh, used if they would stay put and fight out uh, and fight within the city. Because if they try to break out and engage in a battle of maneuver against Americans, they would get wiped out. Um, and in his uh, in his uh, estimate um, assessment, he said that uh, it would also. Uh, follow the instructions of Imperial General Headquarters, which was basically to, uh, def to uh, uh, delay the next American advance. Okay, So what better way to, de to delay the next American advance than to uh, deny a port and a, um, a port facility to the um, Allied forces. Now, uh, but, by the latter part of, um, of February, um, much of this had been retaken already. The uh, Japanese, the remaining Japanese had been confined to this area, which is the old walled city of Intramuros, which was built by the Spaniards. And uh, much of the government center had already fallen to the allied forces and also much of the schools in this general area which were also strong buildings and earthquake resistant buildings. So this was all that was left, uh, a, an area. And then by March, by the first week of March, uh, that too had, uh, had fallen to the uh, Americans. So what was the total, what was the cost of it? Um, the Japanese had lost 16,000 men. Um, the Americans suffered 6,575 casualties, of which 1,010 were killed. There is no accurate number of how many Filipino guerrillas were killed during that one month battle, but um, tens of thousands of Filipino civilians perished in it, either as a result of fighting or in massacres by the Japanese. So that then ends the Battle of Manila. So we, we fast forward to the next major urban battle in the Philippines. Okay? So one would expect that with this type of, uh, this type of um, event that there would be lessons learned. Unfortunately, things happen along the way. Everything's forgotten, right? everything's forgotten. And then you have the same pattern that goes on. Now, the city of Marawi. The city of Marawi is in Mindanao. Okay? So if you're, if you're um, in the US military, it would be, a very familiar place for uh, you guys um, ever since the war on terrorism happened because an American unit was uh, deployed in Mindanao during much of the war on terrorism. And every now and then it still pops up there. Uh, now Marawi is uh, a city of several hundred thousand people that 
uh, lies in the uh, province of Lanao, situated in the province of Lanao del Sur. And here, um, you would see that just like Manila, it is bisect. It is divided into two by the Agus, by a river. This time the Agus River, it divides the city into two. You have here the west side and the east side as compared to Manila's north side and south side. Just like in the Battle of Manila, uh, much of the fighting happened only in one side of the city, which was the east side. In the case of Manila, it was the south side. In the case of Marawi, it was the east side. Um, it's smaller, of course, than Manila. It can actually fit into, it's, I would estimate it's like half of the size of Manila itself. Um, south of the city, if south of the city are the um, training camps of... Uh, Jose, oh, yes. Jose, I hate yes. to interrupt real quick. We do have a couple of questions and I know we're starting yeah. to bump up on time. Yeah. So if, if, if you could bring it to a close in the next minute or so. We yeah. want to really want to get to some of the discussion. Yeah. So, so basically, um, what happened here is that you would have a repeat of, uh, of what happened in the Battle of Manila, an army that had to, that had to adjust to city fighting, which was used to jungle warfare, um, that, didn't, or that didn't have the necessary weapons for it, and because of that, it lasted that long, okay? Uh, it lasted for five months. But in the end, uh, the Philippine military um, um, uh, managed to grow out of that experience. It managed to um, adapt. Uh, its equipment and its tactics were improved. So it, it um, now is um, uh, configured in a way that uh, makes it better to deal with such situations if it should arise again in the future. That, that being said, okay, let's, uh, let's go to the questions. Well, thank you very much, Jose. Um, three great presentations here. We do have a couple of questions. Um, doesn't look like they're directed at anybody in particular. I'll run through them quickly. And if anybody has any comments on them, let's try and we, we are running a little bit on time. So just please bear that in mind. Uh, first question is, um, and Jose, you can stop sharing whenever you're ready. Yeah, great. I'm just stop. There um, you go. There. What lessons are applicable? Uh, wait, that's the second question. The first question is, how can aircraft carriers and land-based air partner today? And are aircraft carriers especially vulnerable in the modern uh, battle space? Go for it, Grant. All right. And I figured, Brendan, you'd chime in too. Of course. Yeah, I, was, I was waiting on that too. So, because Brendan's about to throw a spear through my chest right now. <laughs> um, so, land based air power in the Pacific, we already talked about uh, with the Bismarck Sea, but the biggest thing that we have to deal with now are Chinese land based missiles that can actually reach far out into the second island chain and smoke a nuclear aircraft carrier. Yikes. 5,000 people are on those. That's a national catastrophe. So uh, if they're in range and it's difficult to defend against those uh, missiles, you have to put them outside of that second island chain. You have to put them outside of that zone and still be effective. How do you do that? Well, you're going to have to supplement your ability to launch carrier strike aircraft and uh, you know uh, reconnaissance and support assets, jammers, right, with other assets. Well, where is that going to come from? It's us, right? It's the Air Force. It's the Marine Corps Naval Aviation component. It's a land-based Navy aviation component, right? The Australian Air Force, the Japanese. It's that combined allied mindset of all of these different bases. See, that's that's the great thing about the Americans and friends is we have all these bases. We have all these things we can do, right? We have these options, right? And that's where the dispersal bases come in, where those stand-in forces have to be there the day of to support the naval task force that has to fight the surface battle, right? So you have all these carriers that are going to be outside of that initial first island chain because nobody wants to get hit by a DF-21 or a DF-17. You know, I wouldn't. So you're going to have to stay outside a little bit far back than you're used to, right? But you're going to have to use land-based air power to supplement everything else uh, and overwhelm that battle space. So land-based B-52s, B-2s, B-21s, uh, Marine Corps Hornet squadrons, F-35 Bravos, right? Spread them out, right? You've got this whole American territory 
that you can use called the Northern Mariana Islands. You've got Guam, you've got the Aleutians, you've got Hawaii, you've got your allied air bases in Australia that you could build more of, right? All these allied air bases could pop up over the next couple of years and, and really put a thorn in the side of Beijing when it comes to saying, ooh, I can cut the American air power by hitting the carriers. Well, guess what? Oh crap, I've got all these got all these new air bases popping up and all these new assets that can throw these missiles at me. Well, what is that a C-17 with a bunch of cargo for, you know, pallets of food or is, are they pallets of missiles? Oh, I don't know. Right? It creates a headache for Beijing. So that that's really how the land-based air component has to support the naval component. The Navy should be and maybe in the Air Force and the Marine Corps should be like, you know, tossing back and forth. Hey, how can we work together on this? And I know I, I feel like Brendan might bring it up the land based missiles, too. Right. That's where the Philippines kind of comes into play here. It's where you can station these land based missiles to try and alleviate that pain of keeping the carriers back a little bit further. But with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Brendan, because I know you're going to want to get in on that. Well, I have a, I just have a few things to add to that. So, I mean, you already touched on the land-based missiles and everything. So, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kick it to a horse. I think you covered that enough. I I wanted to add a, a little bit to it. So, um, I think when I originally was answering this question in the chat, I was talking more specifically about um, ISR aircraft, and I think that's my personal bias. That's what I usually deal with. Um, but I think Grant's also right. Bringing in uh, what are the other bombers going to be doing? What are the other uh, mobility aircraft going to be doing as well. But I think the piece that I want to add is the coalition side is right now the United States has um, bombers and ISR aircraft or reconnaissance aircraft. I mean, they, they can fly all the way around the world. There are some ISR aircraft that could fly for more than a day. So I, I, I don't consider them a, a huge hindrance of trying to fly from even the United States all the way over to China those aren't the problem. I think it is the, the attack aircraft or uh, um, kind of the fighters that we really have to be concerned about. And I think that's where it actually hits the third question, which is asking about what do our leaders need to learn from all of this? And I think that's building our partners is because the best part about this is we don't actually actually, and when I say we, the United States doesn't have to build all these bases. We might have to build a few but we've already got bases. Uh, the, the Japanese have air bases. The South Koreans have bases. The Taiwanese have air bases. And they already have planes that they are already in within those first and second island chains. That if we assist, uh, and I think this is where our leadership would need to learn that lesson of, we have to trust our coalition partners too, not just our joint partners, but our coalition partners have some assets that I think can work very well with our own aircraft carriers. We just got to trust them and we got to build their capabilities to go give up against this massive adversary. But I think in terms of time, I'll, I'll just keep it at that. I appreciate that great discussion. And, and we've got a couple other questions, but unfortunately we're, we're up against, uh, we're up against the limit, uh, but great discussion today. Um, for anybody who's interested in more, learning more about what the consortium is doing, indopacificresearchers.org is the website. Um, there's some great scholarship going on there. And uh, thank you guys for your great presentations. And thanks everybody in the audience. And Dr. Saxena, I'll throw it back to you for any uh, any wrap up that you have. Uh, thank you, Cleese. This is a wonderful presentation, wonderful food for thought for uh, uh, our um, scholars and researchers. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for bringing this up, the very interesting topic and uh, discussions. And uh, uh, stay tuned for our next events uh, uh, at our platform. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the participants and thank you very much to the uh, who attended this session.